Hello, I am live with Julia Taliesin from the Somerville Journal. Uh, if you are a regular uh, viewer of Somerville Community Access Television, you know that uh, we regularly have had Julia on to give us a news roundup. So we are, are doing uh, a version of that uh, to get the latest uh, city updates as we are all in this uh, emergency situation. Um, how are you doing, Julia? I'm okay. Welcome to my bedroom, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Dave. No, this is, I'm so glad we're continuing to do this. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I know that there's a lot to cover with a lot of news that's out there. Um, so uh, why, don't, why don't we start with the, the kind of local impact of uh, the COVID-19 emergency uh, and what you're seeing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so kind of just to start off with some kind of quick data points um, as kind of where we're at. And I will say that um, these change really quickly. <laughs> so definitely try to stay up to date. Um, as of uh, like a half an hour ago, um, the, the city website is consistently updated with the number of cases Somerville has. Um, as of about a half an hour ago, they reported 76 cases in Somerville and the first death. Um, that was the first that um, I had seen of that. And as soon as I did, I contacted the city, but I have no information yet at this time. Um, but it is important, um, they have a disclaimer on the website and it's important for everyone to remember that while Somerville has decided and other municip municipalities have decided to report the number of cases they have, it's, it's not necessarily, it doesn't mean that it's an accurate number due to the wide shortage of testing. Um, that's nationwide as well as here in the city. Um, for example, uh, Cambridge Health Alliance opened up the first local testing center um, at Somerville Hospital. Um, since March 18th, when it opened, they have tested 947 people, um, which is awesome. We're very glad we have that testing available here. Um, but there are also a number of restrictions at this time. Um, for example, right now it's only available to CHA patients. Um, and while they were initially considering opening up I think two other testing sites. Again, that shortage of testing kits has meant that for the time being, they're only going to be testing at the Somerville site. That may change soon, hopefully, um, as access increases, but at this point, that's where we're at. Um, so that's just kind of like the short, like quick numbers, I guess, on, on COVID-19 in Somerville. Yeah. Um, of course, there are so many, um, so many areas of life in the city that are being impacted by this in countless ways. Um, you know, one that we're really trying to keep a pulse on is local business. Um, there are, you know, independent restaurant owners who are sending letters to Baker asking for a number of resources. Um, there are, you know, the city is trying to give out a ton of unemployment information, direct people on how the federal, um, care act is going to be impacting people locally um so there's a ton ton going on um, and we're trying to keep up with it um so one one recent thing is the eviction moratorium that the mayor just put in place um this was one thing that uh, municipalities have control over so he was really um committed to protecting renters in this way um, and essentially what this means is that um someone cannot levy an eviction against tenants so they cannot physically remove you from your home while um, this is in effect and he has said that this will be in effect for the duration of the emergency um, so until we lift the state of emergency this will be in effect and the other thing um, i guess it wasn't tech specifically included in the order of the eviction moratorium but it was included in the information that he sent out was that um, he is also preventing landlords from doing any kind of like physical walkthroughs or tenant showings or checks or anything in person. So they cannot send people or themselves come into your apartment during the state of emergency. Um, and he's really been trying to make sure that people have this information and that it's getting out there so people know their rights. Um, so there's plenty of information about that on the website. Um, the director, um, sorry, the Office of Housing Stability has a ton of info up about that. Um, so make sure you know, people don't, can't be walking through your apartment. Um, the other thing, uh, this is, I guess, a little bit more old news. I was, I think it was like last week, <laughs> things changed so quickly, um, is the moratorium on construction work um, right. that the mayor put in place. Yeah. Um, and this is interesting because it's really kind of 
developing at like a local like municipality to municipality level because at this time there is no statewide moratorium on construction work so for example when i wrote a story about this local construction moratorium everyone was like oh my god thank goodness the glx will finally stop and that's not true because the glx is a state project um, and it is not permitted by the city specifically so it is not under our jurisdiction um, but this does apply to private projects. So it's, it's really important that, you know, if, if you were doing construction, if you were, whether, you know, a private citizen, a, a you know, commercial developer, that you, you know, get some information on this. There is an appeal process. Um, there are certain exceptions. Um, for example, um, essential utility work to make sure that everyone, you know, has water, has what they need, has internet, phone service, all of that, that is still going to be up and um, maintained. Um, but it is, it is a big change. And the reason why it's kind of, you know, an interesting issue right now is just today, um, I, you know, just heard from one of some rules representatives, Mike Connolly, that um, he and a number of other some representatives, including Barber, Christine Barber, um, a, I think a majority of our city council also signed this letter calling on Baker to shut down all non-essential construction statewide. Um, so this is, this is still happening essentially. Um, so, and that, it may be, it may be that that impacts the Green Line extension, but transportation is often considered essential, mm -hmm. so it still might not, um, but that's kind of something that's still in process. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I guess I could go on and on and on, Dave, <laughs> but we'll stop there for now. <laughs> And the, the reasoning for uh, wanting a statewide moratorium on construction, it, I, I assume that's because, you know, you have people who are, who are trying to stay at home and then you have others who are coming into those communities and being out and about and, uh, you know, you're assuming that they are uh, doing construction safely and that they are receiving uh, their own sort of health uh, restrictions but you still have that traffic of people in and out of a, of, of a neighborhood um, while construction is going. Is, yeah. that, is that correct? I think, yes, that's absolutely a piece of it. Um, the other part of it, as I understand it, um, is that based on the communications from the city, OSHA has classified um, construction work as a relatively, as a low risk when it comes, not for everything, when it comes to like COVID-19 infection, a low risk um, job. However, um, not all construction is the same. And of course, as we've learned, there's a real difference between people being gathered in a confined space versus people working in an open space. So if there's a bunch of workers working on a large site where they're able to socially distance, where they're able to implement, you know, good um, hygiene and cleaning protocols, they're not in a confined and small space, um, you know, all kind of breathing the same air, if you will, um, that might be a lot less risky. Um, but at this time, statewide, there is there is no kind of mandate or guidance, and it's kind of just all up to you know the contractor or the municipality or the this or that. You know what I mean? Um, and that's part of the concern. Um, that's you know part of why people are asking um, for borders, like state borders, to be effectively shut down. Is because no no one is doing the same thing. <laughs> so unless everyone's kind of working together, um, there's this uh, there's you know a sense that we won't really succeed in kind of beating this. Right, right. Right. Um, going back to the, um, the Somerville numbers, are, do you have any, anything on uh, the number of recoveries? So interestingly, um, this is the first time I've looked on the Somerville website and without having recoveries listed. Up until a few days ago, they were, or maybe even yesterday, they were, um, I knew the last time I checked, there had been nine people who had recovered, but that, at that point there were 49 reported cases. Hmm. Um, so that it may be that the, that number has increased. There are people who are recovering from this for sure. Good, good information there. And, um, so the, the, uh, rent freeze legislation, mm -hmm. I know that that's another proposed piece of legislation on the state level. Yes. Um, can we, uh, can you expand on that for us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is, it's recent and it's not. <laughs> um, for a while, um, Mayor uh, Joe Curtatoni has been kind of in a lot of his press releases around this, when it comes to local business, when it comes to the eviction moratorium, um, he has been expressing his support for this. He, he, you know, he has said that like, 
you know, he has been supporting either a rent freeze or some sort of rent assistance. Um, and when you, when you talk to small business owners, I mean, and just tenants, you, you can see that um, people are like, how is it, you know, how is this not, um, how is this not a thing kind of, because so many people are without a paycheck due to the mandated closures of businesses, but rent was due yesterday. Right, right. Know, for many people. And maybe some people have flexible landlords who are willing to work with them. I'm, I'm lucky to have a paycheck, but I'm also lucky to have a landlord who asked me if I was okay. Um, so some people may be fortunate like that, but others may not be. Um, and, you know, have, may not be able to pay rent at all. And, you know, that's why I said kind of at the local level that eviction moratorium is helping a little because it means those people at least won't lose their housing right now. They'll still have a house right now. Um, but what, um, what's going on now, and, you know, it has local support. Um, a number of counselors are supporting this as well, but Representative Mike Connolly has like kind of brought this up to the state level. So he has been working on a whole, um, you know, slew of, of housing bills. There are a bunch. Um, some of them he's been working on for a while, like the Tenant Protect Protection Act, um, which would give local municipalities the option to reinstate rent control. Um, and some of them are new, including this one, which is not, it's not yet a bill that has been officially proposed. He released it on a website yesterday for public input. Mm, mm -hmm. And he said he did this because things are happening so quickly um, that, you know, he's working with people at the state house. He's, you know, working with his colleagues and, um, you know, fellow legislators and um, all of that. But he wants public feedback as quickly as possible, like what, where people are at on this. And honestly, like just on our one website, there's been so much response to this. Um, and it's important to note that, you know, definitely people are, are really like passionate about a rent freeze, whether it's on one side or the other. Um, but his, um, one of the bills included in his whole kind of platform, housing platform, is also a mortgage forbearance. So this, he is also thinking about landowners and land, landlords and homeowners, et cetera, with this. Um, so right now, I, I think the reason I wanted to, to bring this up is that he, he is actively looking for input and community feedback. Um, so we have an article up about that with all the links you need. There's a, um, a, something you can sign um, to get more information, to add your support to this. You can email him, you can contact him through that form with questions, with suggestions. Um, so it's just something to think about yeah. kind of like as, as we continue. And the kind of the gist of the legislation um, is that you know, any rent that goes unpaid during the state of emergency um, can't be used as a basis for evicting people after. Mm. So what, obviously it's going to mean that, you know, once the state of emergency is lifted, a bunch of people can't just be like, all right, you didn't pay rent, gone. And then a whole bunch of people lose their housing. Right. So it's saying that that can't happen. And also that that unpa unpaid rent can't be support, uh, reported to a credit agency or collections agency. Um, it also guarantees for a year after the emergency ends that um, tenants get to benefit from just cause eviction protections, which means they can only be evicted for cause. Um, and it also means, says that rental payments have to stay the same as they were um, effective March 10th, 2020, kind of before all of this hits. They can't just immediately raise the rents. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there, I'm sure there will be more to it, especially as people suggest things. Um, but that's kind of where, where that's at right now. Yeah. Okay. And you did mention the website, summervillejournal.com, where people can. Yes. I will also just mention though, he, he has it, um, like definitely, definitely go to the Summerville Journal website. However, um, he has it on rentfreeze.org. If you okay. want to go directly to the form and get the information right there. Um, I had a question come into me, uh, somebody asking if the Summerville Journal is still printing at this time. Interesting. Um, I am, um, I believe we are, um, but I will also say that based on the last communication I received from the higher ups, if you will, um, a whopping 2% of our readership is print. So the vast majority of our audience is digital. So very few people receive an actual physical Somerville journal, um, but I do believe we are still printing at this time. Okay, that's good, good to know. Um, and SomervilleJournal.com, the, the, the place to go for all this information. Somerville.WickedLocal.com. Oh, okay. Thank you for correcting <laughs> <It's> me. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, you did mention, yeah, the, it, we just had uh, April 1st yesterday, 
um, and the, the bills are gonna start coming in for April. Uh, mm -hmm. You have a bunch of people out of work uh, uh, in the food service industry, which operates on very, very thin margins. Um, so yeah, we're kind of in unprecedented territory, so it, it would make sense that, that legislators are looking to these kinds of protections for, for renters and others. Mm -hmm. um, at the, the, the job numbers that just came out today were, were staggering um, nationwide, and mm -hmm. Somerville is definitely uh, affected by that. Yeah, absolutely. It's really tough, honestly. I mean, oh, the, um, I think some of the most heartbreaking stories, like we've, I've been reporting on have to do with some of the small businesses, just because there's this, um, you know, people are, people are doing their best. Um, everyone's managing it differently. But, you know, these, <laughs> these people, you know, saved up all this money to open this business. Like you said, it's payroll to payroll for them as well. Um, and to have this happen, um, you know, this, uh, I haven't posted a story on this yet, <laughs> um, but I, I'm working on it now. Um, this huge group of, of independent restaurant owners wrote this really compelling letter to um, Governor Baker. Um, and one of the things they said was, you know, we've, we've been the place um, that makes the neighborhoods. We've been the gathering place for all of your political functions. We've, you know, we've hosted the birthday parties. We've um, been there for people holding wakes and like, and grieving. We, we've been the spaces where you gather. We have supported you. We need you to support us. Um, and it was, it's emotional. It's really emotional to read. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just personally thinking about like, I, I used to go to Diesel Cafe, like, I don't know, at least four times a week. <laughs> yeah. um, I love them. And I've been, you know, I've been trying, I've been trying to, you know, buy gift cards for later, try to still support them. But even then it's, it's hard, you know, thinking about, you know, there, there are many places that I, I patronize that I'm not at the moment yeah. um, that many people aren't at the moment, just cause you know, they're, they're stuck inside maybe for their own safety, for others safety. Some people don't even feel safe getting takeout at this time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's hard. It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but on an up note, <laughs> yes, uh, nice transition to right. uh, a story that you have about uh, a local business that um, is doing something good for its employees. So I'll let you yeah. talk about that. Yeah. Um, so I, I do, you know, want to say that I don't want to kind of like shame anyone. Like I said, everyone is doing their best. You know yeah. what I mean? So, so this is one example. Um, they are also being a brewery. This is I wrote a story about Aeronaut Brewery, Aeronaut Brewing Co. And given that they are a brewery, they, they also have cans so they can sell to go pretty a lot easier. They also can distribute to liquor stores, which are still open. So they are, they are fortunate in that way, for sure. Um, but they also, they had a lot of business, you know, from their tap room in Somerville. Um, and when I was talking to them, they also said, you know, they had a lot of business. Their, their main source of um, income was uh, draft beer, which they would, you know, ship out. And now, obviously, no, no one's drinking draft beer in restaurants right now. Um, so they, you know, are definitely feeling a hit. Um, but what they did, which I thought was really interesting, is um, their four-person executive team suspended their own salaries hmm. um, so that they could continue paying their employees. Um, which is, you know, it's you know, it's a choice. It's it's a tough choice, um, I'm sure. But I thought it was something worth highlighting hmm. um, because whatever way you look at it, it is a bit radical. Um, and when I was when I was chatting with them. You know, they, they're, you know, interestingly, they're still paying their employees, whether they're full-time, salaried, part-time, um, hourly, et cetera. And also, they are continuing health benefits for all of the employees that had them. And when I asked them, like, whether any of this was a tough decision, like, what they were thinking when they were deciding this, they were literally like, we didn't talk about it. We, we didn't even talk about it. We knew that this was absolutely the right thing to do. Health mm. benefits are more important now than ever. And... It wasn't even a discussion, which I thought was really interesting. Mm. Um, but what they said was kind of cool is that, you know, even though um, there's been a drastic reduction in staffing, they said there's been like almost more teamwork now than ever, that their staff is really coming together. Um, there's been a lot of, you know, community. Um, and they also said that, you know, one little silver lining is that um, there are some beers that they, they love, but they haven't canned because they're mostly just like taproom favorites. 
and they had like had plans to can them but they weren't really sure and like maybe we will maybe we won't and they were like this has kind of like gotten us off our asses and now we are canning these beers and distributing them and um they're like it's kind of fun because we we never we never would have done it as quickly like it would have taken us so much longer but yeah. we kind of got our acts together and did this which i thought was really cool yeah. um yeah so so that's kind of you know one you know positive thing if you will um and i will say that um being a being a millennial um i participated in their virtual trivia um last week and this week and because they have trivia there every tuesday night and um in their tap room i think maybe there's like like 40 teams maybe last week there were 120 teams wow and this week there were 250 teams <laughs> hundreds of people they like gave up trying to list people and like it was it was honestly pretty comical mm. um but they said that it's been really helping and that you know people have been so excited for this opportunity to like get together um virtually that you know they've been receiving you know a slew of donations for their employees lots of kind of to-go orders um, they are selling cans at their brewery. Um, they have like a table set up where you like go and you like to put your ID on a table and then they look at it and then they kind of <laughs> give you your beer. It's yeah, very that. hygienic <laughs> yeah, and all socially distanced. Um, but it's, it's been really interesting, you know, even in the, the really tough moments of this to mm. see the different ways that people are trying to make the most of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a very good uh example of people of a community coming of communities of people coming together mm -hmm. um and then we i think we'll end this segment with another example of that uh a story that you brought to my attention of of mm -hmm. some uh volunteer mask making which you know if you're paying if anybody's paying attention to the news you see that there oh, yeah. there is a ton of people out there who are are voluntarily uh you know sewing masks and getting them out to people uh to healthcare workers um so why don't you talk about one of those groups that's doing that here in somerville sure um so i don't know if they have like an official name <laughs> but it's just like a like a neighborhood group um they are i think um you know i don't know i don't know if she would call herself the ringleader um but um uh, renee scott she she is she does a whole lot in the city. She's a member of um, Green and Open Somerville. She's very active around climate action in the city. Um, she lives in the Prospect Hill area of the city and she um, kind of just started getting her neighbors together. Um, she said that uh, her across the street neighbor is Mary Cassesso who works for Cambridge Health Alliance. And she was chatting with her one day and heard um, that Cambridge Health Alliance really needed masks. I think that week they had put out a request for 1500 masks um like by the by the end of the week um and you know they weren't necessarily able to make that many but she said that like between all of her neighbors you know they got a pattern from this place in inman square and then they had you know a couple neighbors donated some fabric and some old cotton sheets and like some had some you know some sewing machines and um so someone had an extra sewing machine so they're sharing sewing machines and you know getting elastic and you know they really she said that everyone was kind of like pulled together um, and, you know, the people who had the time were sewing the masks. Some people who weren't able to give that kind of time bought fabric and had it sent to her. Um, she said during her kids kind of like recess time, she had them like out in the neighborhood, like delivering things between houses, um, which is such a cute visual. Um, but they were able to, this was last week, and they, they were able to make, I think, about 250 masks in a week. Wow. Uh, which is really amazing. Yeah, for just like one neighborhood group. And there are many, many others. Um, who are starting to do this in, in Cambridge and Everett and beyond, um, which is really amazing. It's really amazing because our, you know, our healthcare providers really need it. Yeah. <laughs> they really need yeah. the support. Um, so, you know, this is just one group, um, you know, doing something good. Um, but it is, it is a very happy thing. It made me happy to write about. And um, she is, you know, always looking for volunteers. So if you have an extra sewing machine, if you have some old 100% cotton sheets, they, they got to be 100% cotton. Um, all of this will be sanitized by CHA when they receive it. So it's okay, you know what I mean, that they're just like clean or whatever, like they will actually sanitize them for use. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely contact her. Um, the article is up on our website. Um, you can find her on Twitter. You can find this on our Twitter, on our Facebook. Um, hold on, let me see if I can find the email, which I can. Um, you can email her at ph, as in Prospect Hill, phmaskmaker at gmail.com. 
for more information. That's phmaskmaker at gmail. Gmail.com. Oh wow. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. That's that's yeah. remarkable. Um just a really heartwarming, you know, story of of again people coming together and and I I I think more and more stories like that are are coming to to light in yeah. the middle of this thing. After after this thing, um, that that little ray of hope, that point out there after, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll be able to look at these stories and say, you know, hey, good job, um, you know. And and I think overall, I think we can give a good job, a thumbs up to um, to Somerville to. Yeah. to Humanity in general, I want, I want to feel. I think I think we're all um, coming together in really good ways. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I hope. I hope so. I, I've you know, I've been seeing a lot of good, even even with my head stuck in the news like this all day. So, yeah. Good, good. Um, any any parting words in the last couple of minutes that we have? Anything? Ooh, any parting words? Or anything um, that you're looking to that you might want to? Yes, I mean, I I am still um, I am really doing my best to tell this story from every possible you know direction and perspective that I can. So if you are a small business owner, if you are a resident being impacted um, as a tenant, um, if you're you know struggling with you know having your kids at home, if you know parents who are struggling, if you know whatever, I I am I am doing my best to really just listen to you know how every how this is impacting everyone so my email is j t a l i e s i n at wickedlocal.com you can also find that on the website or i'm behind the facebook and the twitter and the instagram account so if you message any of those you'll get me um, so please do please do reach out um, with any stories with any tips any suggestions um, i'm always i'm always listening all right, Julia Taliesin and the Somerville Journal, always, always listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we still have a minute here, so uh, I do, I do want to just plug some some city websites: uh, SomervilleMA.gov/coronavirus. That's the latest information, um, and then uh, I, be I believe that the, a new page has been set up uh, on that website. Um, let me just double check that. Sorry that I don't have that at the ready, but you know, SomervilleMA.gov, that's, they've been really great. Uh, the people there in the communications department just putting that information forward. So uh, kudos to the mayor's office and the communications department uh, for just keeping everybody abreast of the latest information. Um, and uh, thank you, Julia. Appreciate it.